Satyam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavata Uttam Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Neshtiki Om Ajnana Trimanandasya Nam Yananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Nama Om Vishnupadaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Srimati Ramapad Swami Tinamine Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Charane Nirvishesha Shunnavadi Paschatyadeshe Tarane So the first three verses of the Bhagavatam are the Mangalacharan verses which we also had discussed in fair amount of details to the extent that we could uh, that how they established the foundation for the Bhagavatam. They gave us a sense of the, the subject of the Bhagavatam which is Krishna, a little bit about us and the glories of the Bhagavatam. Then in the flow of the chapter the next set of verses they are primarily uh, glorifying the speaker of the Bhagavatam, which is uh, Sutta Goswami. So, uh, in in the in the fourth verse, uh, we had uh, uh, the fourth verse was the first one where uh, Shanakarishi makes his appearance, and we had discussed a little bit about Shanakarishi, how he is the descendant of uh, the great sage Vrigu, how he is Kulapati. Uh, one who is maintaining more than 10,000 uh, uh, sages, how he himself is supremely qualified, but uh, is taking the position for the welfare of humanity to, uh, to create an environment wherein the Bhagavatam could be spoken. Then uh, the next verse, which we were discussing, we had discussed the first part of it. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly read the Sanskrit and the English. One day, after finishing their morning duties by burning a sacrificial fire and offering a seat of esteem to Srila Sutta Goswami, the great sages made inquiries with great respect about the following matters. So in the purport, uh, Srila Prabhupada, he explains that how Prata Huta Huta Agniya, how the morning time is the best time for us to uh, engage in spiritual activities. And he gives the example of Krishna himself, how in the Bhagavatam it is mentioned, he gets up in the morning and meditates, uh, Krishna meditates upon himself, Srila Vyasadev, he gets up in the morning, took a bath in Saraswati River, and then uh, uh, meditated. Same thing is given in the Bhagavatam about Kardamba Muni. So, uh, uh, giving the reference of great personality, Shla Prabhupada, he emphasizes on this point that uh, as devotees, uh, it is uh, good for a spiritual life to uh, perform activities early in the morning. And uh, uh, <clears throat> And where we had stopped was that we were beginning to discuss a little bit about Sutta Goswami. So this is the first time in the Bhagavatam that Sutta Goswami is, uh, is uh, uh, appearing. So uh, uh, Sutta is uh, the son of uh, Sage Romaharshan. And Romaharshan, that pastime is we discussed, was killed by Lord uh, Balram for failing to stand up and give him respect when Lord Balram had entered the uh, uh, the audience and by a kushagrash by touching him his by the kushagrash lord balram had killed uh, romharshan and understanding was that it was he was not killed because lord balram was insulted or he was angry because he is the personality of god right beyond the modes but more so because he realized that he is not a person who is suitable to speak such an important piece of literature. 
And uh, um, when the sages protested because they had just benedicted Romaharshan with a long life, so Lord Balram he transferred that benediction to the to the son of Romaharshan. So a son is considered to be as good as the father. So he gave he transferred the benediction to Sutta Goswami, and also in order to show his uh, uh, appreciation for the forbearance of the sages. He killed uh, Balwal, the son of Ilwal, uh, who was a, a demon who used to uh, contaminate the yagyas. And after that, uh, on their recommendation, he went for a year-long pilgrimage. So Romaharshan was an expert in the Puranas. And in the Srimad Bhagavatam 1.4.22, Sutta Goswami says, and my father Romaharshan was entrusted with the Puranas and the historical record. So uh, uh, Sutta, the word Sutta means, so the word Sutta means mixed. And uh, Sutta Goswami, he was called so because of his mixed heritage. So in the scriptures, there are two kinds of mixed heritages that are discussed. So one is known as Pratilum and the other is called Anulum. So when, when, when a man from a higher caste, he marries a woman from a lower caste, that is known as Anulu. And uh, a lot of this happened after Parshuram, he had killed the Kshatriyas. So the Kshatriya women, they did not have any men to marry. So they went and established alliances with the Brahmins. And the Brahmin men were of higher caste. So that mixed heritage was known as Anulu. And then there is another mixed heritage in which the woman is of the higher uh, the the woman is of the higher caste and the man is of the lower caste. So that is known as pratilo. And uh, the example is when uh, example is Sutta Goswami, whose mother was a Brahmin, but whose father was a Kshatriya. And through this mixed heritage, uh, 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 the, the descendants are, are known as sutas. Um, according to the Mahabharat, the, uh, the, the suta caste, which is formed by the mixing of the Kshatriya men and the Brahmin women, it is also said that, it is, that they appeared during the sacrifice of Pururava. So Pururava, as you know, is one of the ancient ancestors of uh, the Purus or the Kauravas. And uh, Pururama Rava had performed a great yajna, and at that time, there was a group of people who were uh, entrusted with the task of glorifying the the kings, the lineage, the dynasties, and they were known as suttas. And because the glorification was not really uh, was not really whimsical, it was based on what was mentioned in the scriptures. So such people naturally became expert in the Puranas. So in the Puranas, uh, uh, as we know, one of the symptoms of the Puranas is Manvantaru Ishanu Katha, that uh, uh, a discussion of the descendants of the Manus. And uh, the Sutas, they would be expert in, in, the, in these discussions. And thus they became, they became more and more adept in the, in, in the Puranas. So in the Garud Puran, Sutta Goswami, he confirms this by saying that since I am an Sutta, it is my duty to recite the Puranas. So initially when they sat him down and asked him, so uh, Sutta Goswami, he confirms uh, this. Um, the Suttas are also, and because Suttas are mixed castes, so they are different, they appear in different stratas. So uh, charioteers are also are also considered to be sutas. I'm not sure what was the caste that was being mixed over there, but we see in Mahabharat where Karna, he describes himself as Sutputra. That his father was a suta and who was a, who was a, a charioter. So that is a little bit about the seminal or the genealogical uh, lineage of Sutta Goswami. But this verse really talks about the qualifications of Sutta Goswami. Why is he sitting on the Vyasthan? Why did Lord Balram select him? 
to speak the Bhagavatam. So Srila Prabhupada in the purport, he brings, brings forth some of the important qualities that make Sutta Goswami an ideal speaker of the Bhagavatam. So the first is that he is a representative of Vyasadeva. So uh, uh, Roma Harshan himself was a direct disciple of Srila Vyasadeva and uh, he received when Srila Vyasadeva divided the, uh, the Vedas, he, he taught the Puranas and the Etihas to Roma Harshan and Roma Harshan taught it to his son Sutta Goswami. So he is connected directly in lineage to Srila uh, uh, Vyasadeva. In addition to that, when uh, Sukadeva Goswami was speaking the Bhagavatam on the banks of the river Ganges to Maharaj Parikshit, then Sutta Goswami was personally present in the audience and he heard it from the mouth of Sukadeva Goswami. In fact, towards the end of the Bhagavatam, Sukadeva Goswami, who uh, can see the future, uh, uh, in a verse he says that Sutta, who is sitting over here in the audience, will in the future speak the Bhagavatam in Naimasharanya. In, uh, uh, in uh, 12.13.19, Srimad Bhagavatam, Sutta Goswami uh, mentions, I meditate upon that pure and spotless supreme absolute truth who is free from suffering and death and who in the beginning personally revealed this incomparable torchlight of knowledge to Brahma. Brahma then spoke it to sage Narad, who spoke it to Krishna Dwapen Vyas. Srila Vyas revealed this Bhagavatam to the great sages, to the great sage Sukadev Goswami, and Sukadev mercifully spoke it to Maharaj Parikshit. So, in this way, Sutta Goswami is establishing his lineage all the way from Krishna. The Krishna spoke it to Brahma, Brahma spoke it to Narad, Narad spoke it to Vyas, Vyas spoke it to Sukadev, Sukadev spoke it to Maharaj Parikshit and to Sutta Goswami. So, that is one of his most important quality that he's a direct representative of Srila Vyasadeva. Then uh, he's a Goswami. Srila Prabhupada says that he's a Goswami. In the purport, Prabhupada says, the Goswamis do not deliver lectures on the Bhagavatam capriciously. Capriciously means whimsically. Rather, they execute their services most carefully following their predecessors who delivered the spiritual message unbroken to them. So the qualification is not just knowing the Bhagavatam, but realizing the Bhagavatam. So this is not a transfer of, and this point will be made a few more times in the future, it's not a transfer of knowledge, but it's a transfer of realizations. So Sukadev Goswami did not speak the Bhagavatam just because he heard it from Virasadev. He spoke it because he appreciated and realized it. And the same is also true for Sutta Goswami. Um, in terms of a more, uh, a more technical description of Goswami, Srila Prabhupada in the Nectar of Instruction, verse 1, he's, he says that uh, uh, he gives those five Vegam, Vacho Vegam, Manasakrodha Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Udhar Prastha Vegam, Etan Vega, Yogisha Dhira. So, uh, uh, he says that one who can control these six urges of the speech, mind, anger, tongue, belly and genitals, such a person is, is, uh, Sarvam, is, uh, uh, is able to uh, make disciples all over the world. So, Prabhupada says that uh, when one accepts the renounced order of life, he automatically assumes the title of Swami. This does not mean that he is the master of family, community of society. He must be the master of senses. Unless one is master of his senses, he should not be called Goswami, but Godas or servant of the senses. So Sutta Goswami is a direct representative of Srila Vyasadeva and he is a qualified representative because he is a Goswami. Third qualification that he is a transparent media. So when anybody is speaking about spiritual matters, then it's their responsibility to present the message without any 
distortion. And uh, uh, one can always add their own realizations. That is the reason where so many Acharyas in the past have written commentaries on something that have been already written in the in the disciplic succession. When uh, uh, when uh, Srila Prabhupada was writing the commentary on, I think it was a Bhagavad Gita, and then somebody said that, but Bhakti Siddhanta has a commentary on Bhagavad Gita, and Prabhupada said, this is my commentary, which meant that it is his realizations. Not that he was giving a different message, but, but he was presenting his own realization. And he encouraged his disciples also. He said, you should also write books. In fact, he said, you should write more books than I did, because he wanted to encourage them to, to carry on this lineage of transferring their realization according to time, place, and circumstance. But at the same time, very important to maintain the transparency of the message. So Prabhupada also mentions the responsibilities of the people who are hearing the Bhagavata. He says that they must give submissive oral, oral reception and may ask questions in the same spirit, not to challenge, but to probe deeper into the subject. We want to find the truth. We all want to taste the fruit of Srimad Bhagavatam. So do the sages, so should we. What happens if we listen intently to the Srimad Bhagavatam? Krishna becomes captured in our heart. So the speaker should be a transparent media and the audience should also be a transparent receiver. So once again, the transparency does not mean that the speaker is a parrot and the audience is simply memorizing what they are saying. The message should not be changed, but the realizations can, the realizations can and will always change. So some of the other points that are made in the verse says that he was offered a, he was offered a, a, a seat of esteem. So even though the sages themselves are, uh, uh, Shonaka Rishi is great sage, but he gave Sutta Goswami a higher platform to, to, to sit on. And this is because knowledge tra is, is transferred when one has faith on the speaker. So they're demonstrating both by their own meditation and by the action that uh, they have full faith in the speaker. Then they made inquiries. So uh, the whole process of knowledge travels on the, travels on the, so it said that knowledge flows on the channel of inquiries. If there are no inquiries, then knowledge will not flow. If the speaker simply speaks and goes away and the audience simply sits quietly and goes away, then it means that while there may have been some exchange of information, but no realization would have been exchanged. Um, very often in our, uh, in our Sunday feast talks, uh, the speaker speaks and if there are no questions, then the speaker will say, I'm sorry, I have, I have not done justice to the topic because uh, I have not been able to inspire the audience to ask any, any, any questions. So uh, inquiries are important and more important than inquiries is the mood of inquiry. And we'll see a little bit more about the mood of inquiry in subsequent verses. So this ends the, the, uh, the discussion on the, on the fifth verse. So I'm trying to go to the next slide. Which I am not able to. Okay. So one dot one dot six. Rishya uchu tvaya kalau purani seti hasani changaha akhyatani apyadhitani dharma shastrani yanyuta. Translation The sages said. Respected Sutta Goswami, you are completely free from all vice. You are well versed in all the scriptures, famous for religious life, and in the Puranas and the histories as well.
for you have gone through them under proper guidance and have also explained them. So this is the continuing glorification of Sutta Goswami. And uh, the glorification also is to convince us that uh, he is a suitable candidate to give us the knowledge. So three qualities were spoken in the previous verse, that he is a representative of Srila Vyasadeva, he has controlled senses, he is a Goswami, and that he is a transparent media. And in this, there are three more qualities that are given. So Sutta Goswami is called Anaga. So Anaga means free from vice. So if you remember in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also, he calls Arjun Anaga, as one who is free from vice. So uh, the speaker of the Bhagavad in the purpose, Srila Prabhupada explains that uh, um, how does one become Anaga? So he says that simply by following the four regulative principles, one can become free from all words. So this is a special concession for the age of Kali. In the other ages, one would have to strictly follow the Varnashram Dharma to become Anaga. But in this current age, it is <clears throat> it is simple. Just follow the four regulative principle, and one can consider themselves to be free from vice. Second quality is is that he knows the Puranas, the Dharma Shastras, and the histories. And the third quality is that he has heard and explained the knowledge. So six qualities have been discussed so far. So the third quality, Srila Prabhupada speaks a little bit more about the importance of both hearing and explaining. So in the Parkour Prabhupada says, to hear and explain them is more important than reading them. One can assimilate the knowledge of the revealed scriptures only by hearing and explaining. Hearing is called Shravan and explaining is called Kirtan. The two process of Shravan and Kirtan are of primary importance to progressive spiritual life. Only one who can, only one who has properly grasped the transcendental knowledge from the right source by submissive hearing can properly explain the subject. So you see Prabhupada has put an enormous amount of importance on Shravana Kirtan on hearing and explaining. Generally, we consider Kirtan to be like singing, singing the holy name, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra or the Vaishnava Bhajans, where it is, which it is. But the word Kirtan, so Kirtan, uh, the root word of Kirtan is Kirti. Kirti is fame or qualities, good qualities. Kirtan is one that, one, ones that glorify Krishna, one that talk about, that increase the fame of Krishna. So when we are reading Bhagavatam, which is talking about the qualities of Krishna, that is not different from us uh, uh, singing Kirtan. So even when we were doing in the very first lecture, we were discussing the five S's of uh, Sarna, Sadachar, Swadhyay, Sangha and Seva. So we had said as part of Swadhyay, there is Shravan, Kirtan and Pathanam, Mananam and Nidhyasanam which is, which is uh, hearing, speaking, reciting, studying, and meditating on, meditating on them. So one might say that why, why is hearing and explaining more important than simply study? And uh, uh, in, the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, 3.25, 25, there is this verse that Prabhupada quotes. I'm not going to read the Sanskrit, but just the English. In the association of pure devotees, discussion of the pastimes and activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is very pleasing and satisfying to the ear and the heart. By cultivating such knowledge, one gradually becomes advanced on the path of liberation and thereafter he is freed from his, he is freed and his attraction 
becomes fixed. Then real devotion and devotional service will begin. So coincidentally, this is also the verse that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu first glorified in the conversation with uh, that was uh, that was with Ramananda Roy when Mahaprabhu asked him that explain to me what is the essence of uh, of uh, uh, of the scriptures and uh, Ramananda Roy went through different st stages and, and Mahaprabhu kept saying no 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 and when he recited this verse and then he said yes because in this verse what brings forth what uh, what brings uh, what is brought for, forward is the important aspect of devotee association so when we hear and listen and we hear and explain in the association of the devotees then our hearts are opened and at that point the the association is becomes the channel through which realizations flow and through which eventually bhaktis will also flow so in our context, Vashrika Prabhu calls this as the ABC of Bhakti. He says the ABC of Bhakti is association, books and chanting. So Srila Prabhupada mentions that the term Satam Prasagnam in the association of devotees, discussions of Krishna are very powerful. Bhavanti Hitakarna Rasayan Katha. So Rasayan means tonic. And in India, there are many kinds of Rasayans like the Brahma Rasayan for the brain and others for the heart or the blood, then this is the Rasayan for the soul. And then what is the effect of the Bhagavad Rasayan? So in the third verse in the chapter, we had heard about Pibad Bhagavad Rasa. So the effect is Bhavanti Hrid Karna. It is very pleasing to the ear and Hrid, very pleasing to the heart. So by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, we get a change in the heart. The Srila Prabhupada quotes says, says that these messages of Srimad Bhagavatam will create a revolution in the impious lives of the living entities and the revolution will take place in their heart. And how will the revolution take place? Shanvatam Sokatha Krishna Punyashavana Kirtanam Hridayanta Stubhadrani Vidunuti Subhutsatam Nashtapraeshu Badreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttam Shloke Bhaktir Bhavatir Naishtiki. So that is the revolution. Through Shanvata Svakatha Krishna. By hearing and discussing about Krishna. So, uh, so this is 1.1.6. Um, let me stop over here for a few minutes and see if there is any if see there is any questions or uh, any comments hare krishna prabhu this is varsana devi dasi i just had a point of appreciation um, you know where prabhupada is stressing both about hearing and explaining uh, it, it you know i had this realization where the past couple of years because of our move and things like that, we didn't have the association like we did before, but I was still reading this books, but I, f I always felt like something was missing and therefore this... Go to the next verse, which is the seventh verse. Yani Veda Vedam Shresh. Haribo? Okay. Ma Mataji, you want to repeat your question? Uh, Prabhu couldn't hear, probably. Oh, it wasn't a question. It was just sharing, Prabhu, that I appreciated the point of hearing and explaining because I, I experienced it in my own life where I was. The last two years, we haven't had any like personal association and I was still reading Prabhupada's book. But I felt like there was something missing in my life and it was the hearing and discussing Krishna's pastimes with devotees. That is what was 
you know the key to my progress i realized that thank you thank you and so much and i didn't get the question of the so uh, uh, was very low so my apologies for that but i uh, but yeah i can um, i can completely relate to you that uh, I, when i look back that the periods in my life where i felt that i was enjoying and learning the most are the ones in which i was able to 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 have a lively discussion okay so so let's proceed with the next verse 1.1.7 याद विदा श्रेष्ठो भगवान्द्रया मुनयासूता ट्रांसलेशन बींग द एलस्ट लर्न एंड वेदांतिस्ट ओ सुत गोस्वामी यूर अक्वेंटेड विद द नॉलेज ऑफ व्यासदेव हु इज द इनकानेशन ऑफ गॉड हेड एंड यू ऑल्सो नो अदर सेजेस वर फुली वर्स्ट इन ऑल काइंड ऑफ फिजिकल एंड मेटाफिजिकल knowledge so these set of verses further continue with the glorification of suta goswami the qualities that make him a suitable speaker of the shrimad bhagavatam so so uh, he is glorified as the eldest learned vedantist who has acquired who is acquainted with the knowledge of vyasa so we see this uh, recurring theme of emphasis on parampara and uh, it almost seems that if you would take all the qualities of uh, suta goswami that the sages glorify just because of the number of times that they repeat it the fact that he is connected to shila vyasadev is the most important quality and we'll see that repeated more times in the in in the in the future discussion they also say that you are fully versed in all kinds of physical and metaphysical knowledge now this is an interesting statement it's uh, it would on the first uh, uh, glance it would be a little bit of a detour because the, uh, because the bhagavatam is all about spiritual knowledge but uh, he's been glorified with that he has the all kinds of physical and metaphysical knowledge so physical and metaphysical knowledge means that he is acquainted with the shat darshan including the vedanta sutras so uh, one might wonder that why should one be acquainted with these philosophies which do not directly glorify Krishna? because to some extent that is what has been condemned by or will be condemned later on by by narad muni so why is this quality being glorified in suta goswami so prabhupad in the purport he he writes a statement that is pretty strong he says that one can sit on the vyasthan only after being conversant in all systems of philosophy so that one can present fully the theistic views of the bhagavatam in defiance of all other systems so this is not in this purport pur pur this is uh, uh, no actually this is this comes in late this is in this purport uh, itself so prabhupad is making the point that uh, you should know what is right and what is wrong to be able to distinguish between the two and to also defeat the wrong on the basis of the right and of course whatever prabhupad says it's based on scriptural injunctions so uh, in the bhakti shastri you must have done the isopanishad and in the mantra 11 it is uh, it is a vidyam cha vidyam cha yas tad vedo bhayam saha uh, uh, avidyaya mrityum tirtha vidyaya amritam ashnate that one should study vidyam cha vidyam one should study knowledge and nations side by side and only when they study the both both of them can one can one uh, uh, can one hope to 
cross the cross the ocean of birth and death in chaitanya charitamrita this is an adi leela 2.117 uh, it is said siddhant baliya chite nakaralas yah hote krishna lage sudardamanas a sincere student should not neglect the discussion of such conclusions siddhant baliya chite that uh, all kinds of of discussions considering them to be controversial for such discussions actually strengthen the mind thus one mind gets attached to sri krishna so uh, uh, while it is important for us to nurture and cultivate our bhakti by not being very intimately associated with those who have a different conception but then at the same time in order to increase our uh, our philosophical strength our conviction then we have to see that what is, what what is it that the scriptures say what is it that they do not say or they say that is misleading so prabhupada in the purport gives a very brief description of sat darshan this is an interesting subject and uh, um, um, i will very briefly just mention the six uh, darshans so the six philosophical so what are the sat darshan the sat darshans are mostly atheistic perspectives but they are still considered to be part of the of the of, of the vedas and the reason that they are there is is, is kind of the approach of um uh, consolidate and conquer sometimes we say divide and conquer but what happens in the darshans is that all the atheistic perspectives have been collected in the sat darshans so that they can be systematically defeated so it is kind of like if one is attacked by by so many people in so many directions then the defense also becomes scattered but if 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 the persons attacking are coming in a consolidated column one can focus the defense over there in a systematic so the shit the the shat darshans are uh, nyay by gautam rishi vaisheshika by kannad rishi sankhya by kapila and shila propad always says that uh, this is the atheistic kapila uh, the yoga sutras by patanjali then there is the purva karma mimams by uh, jaimini and then there is the utra mimams which uh, is also considered to be the vedanta sutras by vasudev so the uttar mimams is uh, uh, is more on the impersonal brahman as opposed to krishna as a, as as the person now in addition to this sat darshans there is also what is considered to be non vedic atheism and i wonder if uh, it's possible to mute uh, shri badraini das if you can mute your uh, it's thank you um so there is also non vedic atheism like uh, buddhism jainism uh, the philosophies of uh, charvakra ashtavakra and these are actually blends of these these shaddarshans in fact any form of atheism that exists in the world will draw its root from this shaddarshan they are they are different kinds of blends of this shaddarshan and once uh, a person knows how to how to address and defeat this shaddarshan the person is qualified to defeat any form of atheism so for those of you who are interested in reading more about it uh, Uh, hidden and manaj in the purport uh, of 1087-25 he speaks a little bit more uh, more about it and uh, um, it's uh, it's interesting um, i i i i heard a seminar on this and uh, it was fascinating that you know as part of our preaching we come across so many people making so many points and uh, you think that these are new age points or these are kali yuga points 
but you you are uh, we are able to um, to correlate them to some conceptions that have been presented in in this shaddarshan so uh, shri prabhupad makes this point that we should learn supporting and opposing philosophies uh, he says and this is in the purport of 42929 a strong devotee makes propaganda against all other spiritual conceptions namely gyan karma and yoga with his devotional flag unfurled he always stands fast to conquer other conceptions of transcendental realization whenever there is an argument between a devotee and a non devotee the pure strong devotee comes out the pure so prem ki shri bhai na wait wait If wait, you can wait wait oh, yeah yeah one second bro one second okay thank you prabhu so uh, so shila prabhupad is displaying his mood of simha guru of uh, of 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 being a lion that uh, you know the general conception of the devotee is meek and humble and you know which he is but when it comes to protecting when it comes to protecting krishna when it comes to protecting tatvas when it comes to protecting other devotees then the devotee is ferocious and prabhupada here he is talking like a kshatriya he says the devotional flag is unfold and he is standing ready to conquer other conceptions of transcendental realizations so shila prabhupada wanted us to know the philosophy so that we can preach and defeat the opposition and uh, some of the conversation that prabhupad had with his disciples that were uh, uh, that were uh, written in the later on compiled like uh, um, perfect questions perfect answers and uh, uh, um, the path through transcendence so we see this uh, the prabhupad having this conversations talking about different philosophies and strongly addressing them and the reason prabhupad did that was to to educate us and to inspire us so uh, why is it important for uh, sutta goswami because uh, uh, even even at that time uh, they were they were people with different conceptions uh, later on we'll see that when sukadev goswami came before that parishil maharaj had asked the question that what should a man do who is about to die and what is the duty of a person and uh, there were many discussions that happened at the time but nobody was able to come to a conclusion the reason was that the sages who were sitting over there represented different kinds of philosophies and they were arguing with one another one defeating somebody's point somebody defeating another point even when sutta goswami was preaching at nameshwarnya the sages they had different philosophical conception So Sutta Goswami has been glorified that he is ready to take on any challenges to the philosophy of the Bhagavatam and establishes establish the the real philosophy. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna presents so many so many paths, karma, gyan, and uh, asthan. But in the end, he says that ma me kam shanam praj, just surrender unto me. so even though he presents different philosophies he presents one as the highest that defeats all other philosophies and propat says that one who speaks the bhagavatam should have that qualification okay so we'll go to the next verse vethatvam samya tat sarvam tatvatas tad anugrahat ियमिकॉजिफिकलीफिकलीफोसाइजिंग parampara that uh, in the past verse verses that glorified some of the qualities of sutta goswami now they are saying that the reason those qualities are worth glorifying is 
because they have enabled you to be connected to the parampara. Because of those qualities, your spiritual masters have endured you with all the flavors bestowed upon a gentle disciple. Because of those qualities, you have been able to scientifically learn from them. So those qualities in themselves are not really worth much unless they are used to become well connected with a disciplic succession. So how so so this is how Sutta Goswami becomes qualified to speak the Bhagavatam. His spiritual master has bestowed mercy on him because he is submissive. That is the key to higher realizations. Trinadapi Sunichena. That if you are not humble, you will not learn. If you keep saying, yes, I know, yes, I know, then the guru will simply say, congratulations, you know everything and walk away. I've seen that happen in uh, some of the programs and uh, uh, some, somebody will ask a question and uh, uh, in, the person who's speaking will give the answer and the person will say, yes, I know this, yes, I know this, but you know, but this is what I want to ask and, and very soon the speaker will understand that uh, the mood of the questioner is not submissive. So they will simply say, very good, very good. You know, you know what you know. Uh, there was once uh, Digvijay. Uh, so this is a uh, Mahaprabhu pastime. There's once a Digvijay who was very learned. And uh, he was traveling at different places, challenging scholars, defeating them, and he would get them to sign a letter saying, accepting defeat. So he came to Vrindavan and he came and he said, who's the greatest scholar here? And they pointed him to Sanatana Goswami. And Sanatana Goswami was sitting there humbly and this Digvijay came and he said, I'm such and such, such and such. I have traveled from here and I challenge you to a debate. And Sanatana Goswami said, no need to challenge me for a debate. I accept defeat. So all he got was the signature of Sanatana Goswami. He got his autograph nothing else. Of course, later on, the person was, was defeated by uh, Jiva Goswami. And Jiva Goswami did it in the mood of a, of a disciple. Uh, on the other hand, we see uh, Narad Muni. We'll see that later on in the first canto, where because of his uh, submissive behavior, the Bhakti Vedantas, they blessed him with knowledge that from a, from a, from a Dasi Putra, he became a, he became a pure devotee. So similarly, uh, Sutta Goswami has been glorified for his submissiveness. And uh, he, he had faith. He heard submissively and with faith. So uh, spiritual life is based on these qualities. The quality of submission to the Guru, the quality of submission to the Parampara, and faith. Ultimately, uh, when one desires to make progress, then when uh, these qualities are manifested, then, then the progress is, uh, uh, progress actually happens. So many times there are people who, who may take to Krishna consciousness at the same time, but one may make more advancement than the others. And it is because of these more subtle qualities that are there. So since we're talking about uh, submission, this is a question that often comes up in discussion that what does it what does it actually mean to be submissive and uh, in uh, in hari bhakti vilas there is a there is a definition of submission of uh, submission that is given uh, the six angas of submission anukulasya sankalpa pratikulasya varjanam rakshayati iti vishwaso Guptravate Varnam Tatha Atma Nikshepa Karpanya Sadvidi Sharanagati. So six six items of submission or surrender is uh, Anukulasya Sankalpa. That one only accepts that is favorable to Krishna. Pratikulasya Vajana. That reject those things that are unfavorable to Krishna. Rakshayati Iti Vishwaso that one has faith that Krishna will protect me. Goptravate Varnam Tatha, which is uh, that uh, one accepts Krishna 
as one's guardian or master. Atmanik shape, self-surrender and karpanya, which is to feel meek and humble. So these are things that one can practically do in one's own life to develop the quality and it's a process. One may not be able to develop all the qualities, but by meditating on these qualities of in one's own self and others, one can develop this quality of surrender. And as one develops this quality of surrender, one's heart opens to the realization that is being given in the, in, in, uh, in the uh, parampara. So uh, uh, 1.1.4 to 1.1.8, these five verses, they talk about the qualities of Sutta Goswami. So it, just in terms of uh, the summary, uh, these are the, uh, the qualities that uh, have been glorified, that he is Anaga, free from sin, Akhyatanya Aditani, that he teaches and reads, Veda Vedam Shreshta, that is the eldest, learned Vedantist. Shreshta also means foremost. Soumya, that is pure and simple. Snigdasya, submissive. And Gaurava Guyam Apyota, that he has received confidential knowledge in Parampara. So the, the, uh, and the, on the, the column on the left gives the verse in which the quality has been given. So, even though we saw that the parampara was being spoken about in all the verses, but Gaurava Guyam Apyuta, it kind of summarizes it. That he's connected to the parampara and through that connection he received the Guyam Apyuta. He received the confidential knowledge. So this ends the glorification of, of uh, Sutta Goswami. We now begin with the next section of the first chapter which is questions by the sages so the sages will ask six questions of uh, sutta goswami and uh, uh, some of the questions will be answered right away and the answers will then be expanded so we see that the bhagavatam kind of blossoms out that uh, uh, the the questions are answered very briefly over here but uh, some of the questions actually will subsequently expand into whole cantos and and we see this successive uh, expansion going on so the so to speak the the seed of the bhagavatam is being laid over here um 1.1.9 bhavata yad vineshitam umsham ekantaha shreyas tannaha samshitam marasi Therefore, being blessed with many years, explain to us in an easily understandable way what you have ascertained to be the absolute and ultimate good for the people in general. So this is the first of the six questions that is being asked of Sutta. The question is, what is the absolute and ultimate good for people in general? So, uh, in the previous verses, Srila Prabhupada had glorified the importance of inquiry. And uh, in, based on inquiry, there is discussion. Based on discussion, the, the conception of association becomes uh, stronger. So, uh, it uh, behooves a little bit to talk about the mood of inquiry. So it is important to note that uh, when, one, when one inquires, then one must think to, to, to himself or one is being inquired of to also think of these three points that why is this question being asked? What is the benefit of this question? Is it for, uh, for the benefit of the audience? Is it for the benefit of uh, the person who is asking? For, uh, is it, is it uh, to help the speaker clarify a point that he may have inadvertently missed? So, the, uh, so, so that mood 
is important to ascertain that why this question is being asked. Second is, what is the context of the expected answer? So questions can be answered in, in many, many ways. If you are at work and somebody asks you that, how are you? And you might say that I'm doing well. If the person is a casual acquaintance, if the person is a close acquaintance, you might say that I'm doing well, but I'm troubled by such and such things. If the person is a devotee that you have a close association with, you may, you may reveal even more, even more uh, uh, of your mind. So the, it's important to ascertain the context of the expected answer. And the third is that what is the expected what is the expected level of the answer so one might ask a question like tell me about krishna so you might say krishna is god that is one answer you might say krishna is gopi Vallabh, that uh, he is the lord of the gopis that is another answer or you might say that krishna is the source of all universes which is another answer so they all reflect different moods of Krishna, but in effect, they are, they are revealing the, 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 the depth of the answer. So these three points are important because we see that when the sages will ask questions, because they're experts, they will try and address these three points. They will try and explain, why am I asking this question? What is the context of the expected answer? And what is the depth of the answer that is expected? Generally speaking, and this is not so much uh, from the Bhagavatam, but uh, more so from the general mode of inquiries, uh, there are four kinds of inquiries. There are inquiries in the mode of ignorance, where the questioner, they will ask the question to insult the speaker, or they might ask the question to show the speaker down. There are inquiries in the mode of passion, where the questioner will ask more so to uh, glorify themselves. So sometimes when a person asks a question and you, the, the person who's asking the question is reciting verses or goes on and on, you know, basically answering his own question or explaining many more things. And they're more so to for self glorification. So these are like inquiries in the mode of passion. Then there are inquiries in the mode of goodness where one is asking to increase one's knowledge in a genuine way. And then there are inquiries in the mode of, of pure goodness, Shuddha Sattva, where one is asking to increase one's uh, spiritual advancement. So generally speaking, when we are asking questions, we want to be in the mode of Shuddha Sattva. We want to, we ask questions that we think will increase our relationship with Krishna. When we are asked questions, or even when we are asking questions, we also would like to take care of the first four points, that the first three points, sorry, that uh, uh, we establish why are we asking the question, what is the context of the expected answer, and what is the level of depth that is expected. <clears throat> and the reason that uh, 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 inquiry is, because inquiry is the lifeblood of uh, spiritual uh, study, so important for us because we will be at both ends. We will be inquired from and we will be inquiring also. So important for us to meditate on it. Bhagavad Gita Krishna, the famous verse, he basically says that one, one's inquiry can be fruitful when, when sevaya, when they are along with the mood of service that uh, the disciple uh, does in front of the guru or the questioner does in front of the of the speaker. Prabhupada at one point said that uh, uh, a disciple should act like a fool before the spiritual master. So this is just to, purport, to, to promote that level of submission. And uh, um, I remember Guru Maharaj once saying that uh, one should not misunderstand this to say that a disciple should act in a foolish way in front of the spiritual master. So the process of surrender is 
not that we surrender our intelligence, but that we surrender with our intelligence. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> so that was the so that was an explanation on the word samsitam. Samsitam in the verse, which in the sages are saying, explain to us. Ayushman, then they say Ayushman, blessed with a long duration of life. And this we had a discussion that uh, how Sutta Goswami, by the benediction of Lord Balram, got the, uh, the, the same benediction that his father had for a long duration of life. So Sutta Goswami is going to be sitting and speaking for a thousand years. It's important for him to stay healthy and, and vibrant. Then Pumsham for people in general. So uh, the reason that the sages are asking for Pumsham is because they are able to see the upcoming degradation in the age of Kali. And uh, uh, the ability to see the future is a kind of a Siddhi. So as we know that there are, uh, uh, there are eight primary uh, Siddhis. Uh, Anima, Mahima, Lagima, uh, Vashishtva, Ishitva, Prapti, Parakamya, and then there are several other Siddhis which are either considered to be minor Siddhis or they are they, they come based on the on the primary Siddhis. So one of them is Trikalagyatva, is having knowledge of the past, present, and future. So in a way, all of us have their Siddhi to some extent. We know a little bit about uh, the future. We know a, a little bit about the past, maybe a little bit more about the uh, 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 about the present. But uh, uh, these sages, because they are spiritually advanced, they have seen the future. They are seeing the future, and they are witnessing the degradation in the age of in the age of uh, uh, Kali. Now, uh, the seeing of the future is also practiced in the current day and age through Jyotish Vidya. And uh, Jyotish Vidya is also, uh, is also uh, an, uh, a bona fide part of the Vedas. So generally people who practice uh, Jyotish, at least the one who are bona fide, so they will tell you that there are three levels of, 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 uh, of uh, Jyotish. So one is to reading the, reading the gross and subtle characteristics of the person. So they will read the Jyotish and they will say that this person is healthy, or diseased, or tall, or good looking, or has this kind of a deformity, or they might talk a little bit about the nature of the person, that this person is intelligent, or this person has, has uh, uh, optimism or pessimism. So this is the, the basic, the physical and the physio physiological study of the person. That is the basic part of Jyotish. Then one who is a little bit more advanced, they can read the past. So they can read without without knowing firsthand. They can read the chart and then say that uh, this happened to you ten years ago. This happened to you five years ago. And then people who are even more advanced can predict the future. Um, Prabhupada said that uh, you say that Jyotish is a bona fide science, but there are no bona fide practitioners now. So um, the third aspect of Jyotish, which is which is predicting the future for all practical purposes, non-existent. And people who claim to do that are mostly, Prabhupada would say they're mostly, uh, mostly cheaters, but we see, we see that in the, in, in the, in the, in the Vedic scriptures. Uh, Parashar Muni, he predicted the future of, of so many people. Bhrigu Muni, in his Bhrigu Samhita, he wrote about the future of, uh, of, the, of the jivas. We see in, uh, we'll see in the Bhagavatam, when Parashar Maharaj was born, the astrologers came, and they predicted his future all the way till his till till till, till his uh, uh, death. In uh, Chaitanya Leela, we see Nilamba Chakravarti, the grandfather of Mahaprabhu, came, and he read his chart and he predicted his future that uh, um, that he would bring forth the the, the bhakti movement. But the sages of Nemesharanya, they are they are uh, even more ambitious. They are not only seeing the future but they are sitting here wanting to change the future. So just like seeing the future is the most difficult of all the Jyotish uh, Vidyas, changing the future 
is even much more difficult. And uh, again, there are many people in the current day and age, they will read your horoscope and they will say, in future you will have bad health, but do this and it will improve. But most of them are simply trying to make money or if they are a little bit sincere, then they give you a generic kind of cures, which is mostly through either Sukriti or Prashchit that you know they will ask you to fast which is price shit which generally will negate the effect of karma or they will ask you to perform charity or something which is sukriti which might which acts as a cushion to to the to uh, to bad activities but uh, the sages they are very surgical they know what the falls in the age of kali is which will be discussed uh, in the subsequent verses and they want to and they want to address it so uh, uh, Srila Prabhupada says that this is actually the duty of the, this is actually their duty. Because, because they know it becomes the duty to want to change it. So one, uh, one who has uh, knowledge, it becomes the duty to act upon it. So there is this uh, famous saying, I'm not sure where it comes from, that is, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So similarly, the sages, because they have that knowledge, they are also they are also stepping up to the responsibility for wanting to change it. Otherwise, this way it is said that if a wise person holds the knowledge, then ultimately he loses his intellect or he may become arrogant. If a rich person holds the wealth, they will become miserly. If a strong person holds their strength, then they will exploit, they will become bullies or they will exploit. And if a spiritualist holds the realization, then they will ultimately lose their realizations. So it is not, it is not for the benefit for the others, but for their own benefit also. So when once, when one, so like it is said, the quality of the Brahman is Patan Patan, Yajan Yajan Dan Parakriya that you not only study, but you teach. You not only do yagyas for yourself, but for others. You not only take in charity, but also give in charity. So the sages, they are stepping up to their responsibility and they are saying that, tell us something which is for the ultimate good for the people in general. Now, let's look a little bit on what the, they are asking for. They are saying, Ekanta Shreha, Anjasa, the one thing for the ultimate good that is easily available. So three parts of the ask. They are saying, tell us only one thing. So they don't want to go to the multiple path option that Srila Vyasa Dev had gone that you can do, you, you can you can uh, you can do this or this karma or, or gyan or astang or uh, uh, you can do gradually uh, progression. They are saying, tell us one thing only but that one thing no compromise on that you don't don't think that because you're telling one thing then it is a it is a penultimate step it is a half step it should be for the ultimate good and not only it should be one and for the ultimate good it should be easily done so we can see that the sages they are being very merciful because of the age of kali if these three conditions were not being met, it would be difficult for people to follow. Because it is very difficult for them to follow even one thing, if they're given options, they would get bewildered. Because the lifespan is small and the thinking is confused, if it is not for the ultimate good, then they would get bewildered by things that are, that, that are incrementally good. And if it is not easily done, they will not be able to do it. So Sutta Goswami might say, now wait a minute, you're being, you're being too exacting, you're asking a lot of me, that uh, there should be only one thing that should be for the ultimate good and it should be easily done. So the sages say Tatra Tatra. The first two uh, words in the verse is Tatra Tatra. Tatra Tatra means therefore, thereof, thereof. So the sages are saying, so this verse, connects uh, this Tatra Tatra, it connects this verse with the previous set of verses. 
So the previous set of verses were glorification of the qualities of Sutta Goswami. So they are saying because you have all these qualities, therefore, therefore, you are you are fully qualified to give us what we are asking for. Because you are you are connected to the disciplic succession, you are submissive, you have received the mercy, you have learned, and then you explain all the qualities that they have glorified. Tatra tatra. Therefore, therefore, so in, in their enthusiasm, they are saying that don't think that we are asking you something that you cannot deliver. Because of all these qualities, you are you are you are fully capable of giving us what we are asking for, which is telling us the one thing that is for the ultimate good and that is easily done. So uh, uh, the other line in the verse is, is bhavata yat vinishchitam, that by your, that ascertained by your good self. Don't give us, don't give us theoretical knowledge. So uh, once again, making the point that, th that spiritual exchange is done on a platform of realizations. And uh, Srila Prabhupada has a commentary on this. Uh, he quotes this famous verse. It's, uh, it's uh, from uh, uh, Mahabharat. It's spoken by Maharaj Yudhishthir. And uh, I'll read the verse uh, because it's famous. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard it. Tarko Pratishta Shrutaya Vibhinna Nashava Rishi Rasya Patam Nabhinnam Dharmasya Tatvam Nihitim Ghuyam Mahajano Yena Gata Supantha. So Prabhupada like to quote this verse, especially the last line, Mahajana Yena Katha Supanta. And uh, he, writes a, he writes a commentary on this verse. This is uh, in a lecture that he gave. Uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't write, but he gives a lecture on it on Srimad Bhagavatam 7.5. So Prabhupada says, in the Shastra it is said, Tarku Pratishta. Simply by arguing, you cannot come to the right conclusion. You, you may be a very good arguer, but another arguer may defeat you by his argument. So in this way, simply by dry arguments, it is not possible to come to the conclusion. Tarko Pratishta Shutaya Vibhanna. There are different scriptures. There are four Vedas and there are many other corollaries. So simply by studying at home these books, that is also not possible to understand. And Nashava Rishi Yasya Matam Nabhinna. And if you follow philosophers, one philosopher is different from another philosopher. Just like our Sham Sundar, who bought one book, Ideas of Philosophers, different philosophers talking differently. So how can you take the conclusion? Even Aristotle, he's talking so many things, nonsense. So mental speculators, philosophers, in this way you cannot. Dharmasya tattvam nahitam guhyam. Actually, the purport of religion and God is very confidential. It is in the heart of the pure devotee. Therefore, to understand it, one has to follow the great authorities. Mahajana yena gatha supantha. When the devotee speaks, the truth is revealed. Why can't we find the truth? By reading the Shastras ourselves, because the parampara should first digest it. So that is why the that is why Sutta Goswami he established the parampara. Then from Krishna to Brahma to Narada to Vyas to Sukha to Sutta Goswami, then from Srila Prabhupada, and then we get it. In 1.1.3, the point is made that uh, Sukha Mukha Dhammurtam Samyutam. That the Srimad Bhagavatam coming from the mouth of Sukha, Sukha Go, Sukadeva Goswami, the nectar, it's Samyutam. It is fully digestible. It is very easy to, to uh, digest. So in the purport to this verse, Prabhupada says, the Acharyas and the Goswamis are always absorbed in thought or the well-being of the general public, especially the spiritual well-being. That the sages therefore desire a kantashreha. What is the best thing for the uh, for the life? So a short story here, and after that I'll stop. Uh, when uh, uh, Shila Prabhupada was once in India in the early 70s, he was visiting the house of a retired judge, and uh, um, along with him was Malati Mataji and uh, her daughter uh, Saraswati. So Saraswati had a deity of Krishna. That she was very attached to and she carried with her everywhere. So while she when she was not looking, then Srila Prabhupada took the deity and hid it. And when uh, the little girl realized, and then she became very anxious, and she went around saying, Krishna, where is my Krishna? Where is my Krishna? Have you seen my Krishna? And then Prabhupada wanted to make this point 
that is the mood of a devotee that they are so attached to krishna that they cannot bear separation even for a moment he wanted to make that point to the judge and then saraswati went to his to her to her mother malati mataji and malati mataji said uh, who do you think has krishna and then saraswati she had like big eyes and she said prabhupad so she went to prabhupad running and she said give me krishna and prabhupad then gave krishna to her so which is the other point that the guru is the only person that can can give us krishna so uh, so this was the first question and after that in the subsequent verses not not consecutively we will see the other five questions coming but uh, it's a good point for me to stop and uh, i'll uh, we'll see if there's any uh, comment or questions hari krishna bodhana can you hear me too uh, yes prabhu i can hear you the inquiries you were talking about if i have a question i get some answer where you said no if i don't uh, get the answer prabhu one second prabhu prabhu one second i'll mute all others i'll one second okay one second hello hello yes 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 hello Oh, it is you only. Okay. Chat opener. Oh, wow. Prabhu, I'll mute all. So let me ask few questions to you first. <clears throat> yeah, bye, Rupa. Uh, I have a question. Yes, Prabhu. Um, the the just one what we discussed about. the jyotish shastra he said uh, whatever the remedies what the astrologers give right uh, like for the for example to fast some for some benefit or something so how do we take what the fasting we do for ekadashi so that is for uh, spiritual benefit like when we fast uh, uh, so uh, so like krishna says that uh, 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 of all the of all the festivals janmashtami is janmashtami is his favorite followed by ekadashi so these are things that we do for the pleasure of krishna and um, you know one might question that why is krishna happy when we are hungry but uh, fasting is uh, so to speak secondary even though it's a little difficult for us to understand because that becomes a primary meditation but the idea is when we fast then we are able to uh, free up our time and our minds to focus on uh, krishna katha or krishna kirtan or uh, krishna seva so that so we get more time to do activities um, that are conducive to our uh, uh, to our spiritual life um, the other aspect also is that um, um you know such uh, uh, such so called austerities that we do they demonstrate our sincerity of purpose that um, you know fasting on ekadashi is nothing compared to what the sages did which is you know meditation in cold water for thousands of years or or you know sitting in fire etc but nevertheless it is it is our offering 
it is it is our offering that um, this is a little bit what we can do and sincerely this is what we are offering and ultimately krishna is bhava grejanartham that he takes the essence of what we offer and uh, accepts it for what it is thank you Prabhu. so i have another question if i may mm-hmm. uh, there's a two fold question actually uh, the in this in 117 verse we spoke about the spiritual injunction one should study knowledge and nation side by side right that's when we give uh, from the realizations uh, we say that whatever we read and uh, do kirtan like we have to explain also now the two part for first part question is i see a lot of congregations we are encouraging our young devotees to preach uh this is based on what the what we have studied or what the so what those young devotees study right so what is your uh, what is the guidance over there is it uh, they are allowed to preach or to get get more of a what they read to be able to preach or as they don't have any realizations it is not recommended how do we do that it's a very good question prabhu very practical and um, the general understanding it's a question that i have also asked my guru maharaj and you know other senior uh, devotees the general understanding is that one must preach to the level of one's realization i remember the first time i was asked to give a class in the temple and i was a little hesitant me i said i'll be sitting on the vyasthan and there proper disciple sitting in the class and uh, um and other many more senior devotees and then the person who asked me to give the class saying you too, should not think like that uh, it's uh, it's it's your realizations that they're sharing but just preach to the extent of your realizations don't artificially uh, say something that uh, either you have not uh, experienced or uh, that is not in that is not something that you were aspiring to experience like we say that uh, you know, the purpose of life is to surrender to krishna mm-hmm. now not many of us have have accomplished that but the reason that we feel that we are qualified to say that is because we are aspiring for that we are work in progress and we are also sharing our aspirations that it, the purpose of life is to surrender to krishna and we are trying to do that but it is not it that it does not make sense if you speak things that are beyond your realization that if you start to once somebody starts speaking about uh, esoteric aspects that uh, either you don't have aspirations or you don't have realizations you know then they become very quickly uh, in that area of uh, in that murky area so prabhupada encouraged all his disciples to preach in fact uh, if you look at some of the very very early videos of prabhupada i was looking at one of the videos that was shot uh, i think in 1968 and uh, um, uh, a television crew is uh, is interviewing uh, a disciple of prabhupada that uh, his uh, i'm not sure what his name is or if he stayed and uh, and he was speaking uh, you know he was speaking about krishna is god the purpose of us to surrender to krishna and uh, we should uh, um, uh, serve other devotees very very nicely he was saying and the person asked him that uh, um, how long have you been uh, uh, being studying with the swami and he says two weeks and i was very surprised that within two weeks he was able to assimilate the, all that to the point that he was he was uh, he was uh, 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 you know he was openly sharing it with uh, with the reporters and with other people also uh, when we preach then the most important person that we are preaching is to ourselves yeah. so um, uh, it is yeah, that's why it is not recommended but it is mandated that uh, if for, for like for the bhakti vaibhav class now we cannot do it because of the format that we are following but an essential ingredient in the bhakti vaibhav class is that all the students need to give a class at least one class and preferably more but in addition to that they should also and which is what i had spoken earlier on and i'm encouraging you again that all of you should take an opportunity 
to give a class in the temple either the either the bhagavatam class in the morning or the sunday feast lecture or some other format because uh, that is really the most potent way of uh, developing a closer relationship with the subject that you're studying thank you prof but uh, for the first question only i have another uh, extended one so the kids uh, nowadays we see few kids whether it is in our congregation or few other congregations we are encouraging kids to give classes as well so how to take that uh, is it uh, we are expecting them to be more realized or expecting them to learn more from their uh, preaching well, both prabhu i think the same the same uh, principle applies yeah. that uh, when uh, when uh, when we encourage children and we should when we encourage children to give classes then as part of their preparation they will develop a closer relationship with the material and the idea is also they speak according to their realizations you will see the classes of the children are uh, are a lot more sweeter and because you know their heart is their heart is simpler they don't have a lot of stuff that we accumulate as we grow older so you know their their classes are much more uh, are much more sweeter and it's a very potent way for them to um, uh, just to, to develop this this ongoing relationship not only with the scriptures but with the devotees um, also we don't have that unfortunately uh, uh, at at our temple but uh, i would say it's an it's an excellent idea if you're getting kids who are uh, who are agreeable to doing that you should by all means encourage them absolutely prof the second uh, question i have is similar to this uh, we also said the realizations what we get uh the, where we have knowledge and nation side by side so the realization what we may get is um uh, in, in on a daily basis whether at the workplace or whether we go any other other than the spiritual aspects as well so how to mix these realizations with our preaching is it like first of all number one is it to is it okay to get those kind of realizations and preach so my understanding is that um, for a devotee there is nothing that is not spiritual okay it may be a it may be a different it may be more in the modes at some point of time and uh, more in the realm of spirituality but uh, every realization at least for a devotee gives them a glimpse either of how they are how they are uh, dealing with the material world or how they can, they would like to deal with the uh, with the spiritual world i have seen that in myself that you know i'm i'm sure a lot of us here have you know, long work schedules and you know we we are dealing with people and some of the some of the dealings are not going harmoniously and you know and then you get the realization that at the end of the day just the moods and this the, the moods are acting and uh, some verse of the bhagavad gita will pop up in your in your, in your mind that that's what's uh, that's what's going on and you know, when you are in the temple then the different kinds of realization somebody is talking about chanting and their most spiritual realizations but uh, you know but ultimately uh, at least for a devotee everything that happens it either gives them a glimpse into the material world or the spiritual world and both of them you know it goes back to the same point the study of knowledge and nations so there are some realizations that that will give you a glimpse of nations there are some realization that will give you a glimpse of knowledge both of them are equally important you act upon one to free yourself from nations you act upon other to um, uh, become more strongly attached to the uh, to the spiritual aspect thank you prof uh, i'll be unmuting everyone i'm sorry actually i took more time uh sorry krishna hari prabhu hari hari krishna there are two questions one is about inquiries like uh, if we have some question and we ask somebody some devotee and if we are not satisfied with the depth of answer at the uh, so like is it okay to answer some uh, you know senior person or we know somebody who is really knowledgeable in that 
Absolutely, absolutely. I think, uh, if there's a genuine inquiry, then uh, um, uh, then then it becomes important for uh, you know for, for person inquiring to pursue the inquiry till till the person is satisfied. Uh, with it. I've seen many times uh, with uh, with uh, Rampat Swami, Radhanath Maharaj. Somebody asks them a question, and they will give an answer, and they will say, "Are you satisfied?" And if they see the person is not satisfied, they'll give some more answer. Are you satisfied? No. Okay, come to me after class, and then maybe we can we can talk. Or sometimes they will say that um, um, you know I, I know there are some times when I've asked Guru Maharaj a question, and then he, he will forward the email to somebody else, saying this person is better, is more uh, more suited to 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 answer. Like um, when I was being, and I still haven't got that answer. Somebody had asked me the question about the title of the fourth canto of the Bhagavatam. And I didn't know the answer, so I asked Prashpari Prabhu. He said, I don't know the answer. I'll send it to, to Suhartha Swami. He sent it to me. I haven't heard back to him. But but the mood is, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the mood is perfectly fine. That you have a question that you feel uh, will help you make special advancement. You should definitely seek out uh, um, uh, from the proper sources, uh, the you know, the answer that satisfies your heart. Thank you, Prabhu. One more question is like, how to understand Bhajananandi in the uh, sense of like you were telling that uh, one has to so listen and explain also. Uh, Bhajananandi is more of uh, always practicing and enjoying the devotional service, uh, the aspects. So like some, uh, I have heard in this con saying somebody like, uh, you should preach and uh, like preaching is, is all that we have, we listen. Uh, but Bhajanand is not more, must more uh, much inclined in towards uh, preaching. Um, and in personal aspects, as a few people are tend to uh, become, uh, you know, just receiving, receiving only. Or if not, they are not. Uh, as you said, you you need to give classes, all that. Uh, so how how to take that and understand that bhajananandi and preaching thing so Prabhupada talks about it he says there are two kinds of devotees goshtanandi and bhajananandis and uh, um, goshtanandis are uh, Prabhupada says we are goshtanandis so when you're connected to a parampara you naturally you inherit the mood of the parampara you know Srila Prabhupada was a strong preacher that was the mood he's a goshtanandi and we are connected to Srila Prabhupada through, through our Guru Maharajas. So we also have that mood. Our, our Guru Maharajas are strong preachers. So we also have that, that mood. Prabhupada also says in the purport that uh, between Goshtanandi and Vajnanandis, the Goshtanandis are superior because they, they, they um, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact words, but he says something like they put their own spiritual lives at risk to help other people, which pleases Krishna. So when you're going out and you're reaching out to new people, so whenever you touch somebody, the touch is two-way. That you give association, you also take association. So when you reach out to people and you try to preach to them, then uh, uh, they also influence you, which means you're putting your spiritual life at, uh, at risk. Uh, but the fact that you're taking these risks on behalf of your guru and on behalf of Krishna it makes uh, it makes their benediction flow more free to you. Um, if you if you talk to some of the or you hear the conversation of some of Prabhupada's earlier disciples who were book distributors, then you will see that how they were getting so much mercy because they were undergoing so much uh, um, they were undergoing uh, um, so many risks they were taking on the path of uh, part of uh, uh, Srila Prabhupada. So, so uh, our mood is that of Goshtanandis, that you know we 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 hear, and we and we preach, in the purest sense. And this is more I'm talking now from a technical perspective. The Bhajnanandis are also people who have reached the level of spiritual realization that they can execute a Kanta Bhakti. And uh, uh, they are, you know, they are people who have reached the stage of bhava or or prema, and uh, they are fully satisfied in associating with the holy name, that they are able to see the holy name for uh, for what it is that is non-different from Krishna, and uh, derive association 
from it. We see in some time, even though the six Goswamis were very strong preachers, but we also see glimpses of that when they reveal that Rupa Goswami was chanting and while chanting he entered into the Leela of uh, Radha and Krishna. So that is the mood of Bhajna Nandis. They are very, very exalted. We are not, we are not at that stage. So it does not behoove us to try to aspire to be there also. So, in, that case, in that case, actually, like we see uh, Narottam Das Thakur uh, aspiring for uh, association of uh, Srinivas Acharya and all that, though they are uh, exalted, exalted uh, Bhagavatas, uh, but still they are, uh, uh, you know, uh, Right, 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 and the, that is that is the general mood of uh, of the of the Gaudiya Vaishnava Parampara. That uh, if you look at the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that uh, for the bulk of his life, he was very strongly preaching, except for the last few years in his life when he was more of a bhajana nandi. But for the bulk of his life, he was very strongly preaching, and we see the same in the six Goswamis or the followers. We see the same in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Srila Prabhupada and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Later on in one of the verses in the purport, Srila Prabhupada says that uh, um, that because in the age of Kali, people becomes, become, have become so averse to spirituality that uh, uh, many Vaishnavas have withdrawn and they are practicing the Vaishnavism in isolation. But then he glorifies his Guru Maharaj and says, but my Guru Maharaj, he ordered us to take additional risks and um, in order to please them, he says, "I'm, you know, I'm taking, I'm taking this additional risk." Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for the answers, Harish. Okay. Anything else? Harishna Prabhu, this is Nandakopal Das. I just have one question about uh, the cast um, of. Sutta Goswami that you spoke about. And now in that, um, I, the question is, Krishna says the caste is created by him based on guna and karma. But then we always say about the birth. So how to reconcile this? You know, most of the time we start to speak about um, different caste and based on the birth, uh, not necessarily on the guna and karma. So how to reconcile these two things in, that comes in the scriptures? So there's a bit of a there's there's a, there's a bit of intersection between um, what is considered to be seminal caste and what is uh, uh, guna karma vibhagasha. What is caste that one acquires based on one's uh, uh, propensities and uh, and activities. So a large a large part of the Vedas uh, gives stress to seminal caste. And uh, uh, the reason is that um, based on the environment, so this is explained a little bit more in Manusmriti, that uh, based on the environment that the person uh, grows up in, they receive certain samskars. And they also receive certain characteristics based on the parents that they are, uh, that they are born of. So, um, so, so that way, uh, the seminal caste is is kind of justified. That person born of Brahman, Brahmanical parents uh, will is more likely to acquire Brahmanical qualities than one who is born of uh, Kshatriya uh, uh, parents. Um, the rejection of uh, the seminal caste uh, that happened later on, and more so during the later part of uh, the later part of Dwapar Yuga and the earlier part of Kali Yuga was uh, when uh, even the even uh, the the caste had lost their own qualities. The Brahmins were no longer Brahmins. The Kshatriyas were no longer Kshatriyas. So even though they did not have the qualities of the caste that they belonged to, but they were still proclaiming that my son is a Brahman and my son's son is a Brahman, and you know, and that is why you know, that is why the rejection came in that. Uh, uh, there is no, you know, factually speaking, in the age of Kali, there is only one caste. There is no other caste. Kalo Shudra Sambhavate, that everybody is a, is a, uh, um, is a Shudra. Um, this discussion of, uh, yeah, of uh, Sutta Goswami belonging to a mixed caste um, 
uh, really speaking, it's not a part of Bhagavatam. So I just wanted to clarify that, that um, um, it, it basically comes up in, um, comes up in certain discussions on the Bhagavatam. You will not see anywhere within the entire uh, uh, 18,000 verses where uh, uh, there is a mention, there is any mention of Sutta as a caste uh, there. It is mentioned in the Mahabharata. That's more mentioned uh, over there. So uh, that's the reason I spoke uh, about it here. Not not to give the sense that Bhagavatam is emphasizing caste, but uh, more so that if somebody somebody may inquire of you that uh, the Bhagavatam was spoken by a sutta, then what you know what was it? So it kind of helps us get a little bit of background in that. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we'll uh, end over here. Vancha kalpata rubaya shchit kripa sindhu vyevacha patita nam pavane bhyo vaishnava bhyo namo nama ananta koti vaishnava vrinda ki jai prabhupada ki jai hi go thank you prabhu thank you hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna